first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that uh, your faith and hope are set on God. And now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the first people who uh, read 1 Peter knew what danger was. They knew what hardship was. They, they knew uh, what persecution was. They knew about pain and suffering. Though they didn't go looking for it, they didn't have to. It just came. It came like uh, parsley with your hamburger at Denny's. And it came largely because they were different, uh, because they had different ideas and, and beliefs and, and values. They were said to be immoral uh, because they didn't participate in the holidays and the rituals and the celebrations that everyone else participated in. They were said to be atheists. When the flag was raised, they didn't stand up and salute. When the emperor walked by, they didn't bow down and worship. We, we bow only to God, they said. We pledge our allegiance only to Jesus Christ, they said. And so they were said to be disloyal, bad citizens. And for that, they suffered. Though no one was happy about it, and, and a good many of them wondered if it was worth it. Well, 1 Peter was written to encourage them and to assure them, to help them find some meaning in their suffering, uh, to urge them to stick together and keep the faith, uh, to, to give them confidence in God and give them hope. It's curious that such a letter should come from Peter, don't you think? Peter wasn't exactly a, a rock of Gibraltar when trouble was afoot, you know. You remember when Jesus was arrested and, and, and Peter denied him, said he didn't know him, said he wasn't one of them uh, three times. And later in, in the book of Acts, we read about, uh, uh, or actually in Paul's letters, a uh, letter to the Galatians, we read about uh, Peter, that in, in Antioch, uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians were uh, eating together a uh, common meal, and Peter was part of that, and until some people from uh, church headquarters in Jerusalem came and, and said, maybe people should not do that, eat together, Jews and Gentiles, and Peter said, well, no, not me, I'd never do that, and you remember what, what Paul said about Peter in his letter to the Galatians? He, he said, uh, what a two-faced, uh, two flip-flopping fink, or something like that. Anyway, in, in this letter, Peter reminds us of our responsibilities during difficult times. And several times he says that we are pilgrims or exiles or aliens, strangers in the world. Uh, we are not at home here. We, we are different. You know, like your mother used to say when you used to say, everybody's doing it, why can't I? And she'd say, because we're not everybody. We are different. 
We are in the world. We are not of the world. That we are now members of the uh, household and family of God. Well, new Christians uh, need help understanding uh, how their new family is going to relate to their old family, especially if their old family doesn't share their beliefs. How should they deal with husbands or wives or parents or children uh, who, are, who may not be believers? And what about friends, uh, neighbors, employers, uh, colleagues? Uh, what about the government and schools that, that may not only not share their beliefs, but may be hostile to them and towards their faith? They still live among them. They still have to see them and work with them, uh, you know, every day. What, what should they do? How will they get along? Should they get along? Oh, it, it, is, it is curious that this letter should come from from Rome, where Peter wrote this letter, the capital of the empire that was in many ways giving them such a difficult time, uh, where Peter and Paul both ended up being killed for their faith. In the end, Peter did stand fast. He, he did hold firm to his belief. He ended up being crucified, and by tradition, crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to be crucified like Jesus. But he knew well the pressures to, to conform and to compromise. Here he says, keep your conscience clear. So far as you can, don't give anybody any reason to hate you or hurt you or be afraid of you. As far as it is possible for you, live at peace uh, with everyone, even those who may disagree with you. Baptism, says Peter, is the, the response of a good conscience or God. Well, people who have spent many years studying this letter of Peter uh, say that it was originally a sermon, a sermon preached on the occasion of a baptism. It's a baptismal sermon. Here is Peter explaining to people who are new in the faith and reminding those who've been around a while what it means to be a Christian. When people came to be baptized, they were told that they were uh, leaving their old life behind and beginning a new life. In some churches, they were, they were given some milk and some honey, uh, remembering when the Hebrews uh, were saved from slavery in Egypt and, and they wandered in the wilderness saying that they were bound for the promised land, a land that they said was flowing with milk and honey. When, when Israel left Egypt, they passed through the waters of the Red Sea and they, they left one life behind and they began a new life. The, the wandering in the wilderness was no walk in the park. Just so with baptism, the Christian life is a journey. Beginning in the waters of baptism, our destiny is something wonderful and glorious. Milk and honey are a sign and a promise of that. But we haven't arrived yet, and you ought to know things may not be too easy. Things may get difficult along the way. Now, Peter says, is the time of your exile. Some translate that as, uh, you are resident aliens. In other words, to be baptized means that you don't live here, but it, it, you live here, but it's not your country. You're not citizens. You're not really at home here anymore. So don't get too settled. Don't get too attached. Literally, it says that the baptized are outside the house, but close to the house. Maybe you're in the yard, maybe you're in the garden, I don't know, but you're not in the house. The, the Greek word is paroikos. Oikos means house. Par means beside, but not inside. Paroikos. It's the word that gives us our English word parochial, meaning to be at home in the parish, but not in the uh, uh, larger community. Uh, Christians are members of the oikos, the household of God. But in this world, we are paroikos, the exile, the outsider, the, the one without a home. And what, what, what does that mean, practically speaking? What does it mean to say that after you're baptized, you are a resident alien, uh, an exile, a stranger? 
Well, some have taken that to mean that uh, when you become a Christian, you're supposed to join a, a committed group of other Christians and have nothing to do with the world and, and your former life or your friends or your family, uh, like the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas some years ago who separated themselves from the world, or like the people in Jonestown in Guyana, uh, 900 people bonded together, living together, working together, pulled away from their families, pulled away from their friends. And many are still grieving the deaths of those people. During the 60s, some, some young people, mostly college students, uh, dropped out of society and they joined groups with names like the Children of God. If you're really committed, they said, uh, you won't have anything to do with your family or your friends anymore. You're now a resident alien in the world. You are outside the house. I had a high school friend who got hooked up with one, with one of those groups. He, he quoted the scripture where Jesus says, unless you hate your father, mother, brother, and sister, you can't be my disciple. And then he left home and no one heard, ever heard from him again. It broke his mother's heart. It might have killed her if she hadn't been a wonderful, faithful Christian woman herself. But I guess that didn't matter to uh, her son and his new friends. Well, that's the most radical, that's the most fanatical way to interpret the message of Peter here in this letter. There are others who don't take it uh, so far, but they still believe that Christians should be different and should live apart from the rest of the world. Some of the most beautiful Christian people you'd ever want to meet live out their faith that way. I'm, I'm thinking of the Amish. They dress different. They, they don't use cosmetics. They don't wear jewelry. They drive buggies instead of cars. They marry only people like themselves. They, they live simply, but, but they make some of the, the, the best food in the world and the furniture and quilts. And they, they always make sure that they have at least one mistake in their quilts because that's to remind them that no one's perfect, uh, no one but God. We are resident aliens. We are not of this world, they might say. We are exiles. And people ought to be able to tell that. People ought to be able to see that, even from far away. Unfortunately, not everyone wants to live in the 17th century and drive buggies. But they still want to show that their faith makes, uh, makes them different. And, and maybe you'll see them wearing a cross necklace, uh, or some kind of necklace like Jennifer and, and Joanna are wearing to signify their baptism. Or maybe they drive cars with a bumper sticker on it that says, Honk if you love Jesus. And some of them love their children so much they put them in parochial schools so they won't be exposed, exposed to other kids or other ideas that they don't want them exposed to. Some, though, when they become part of a church, they, that, that, that church becomes their whole life. And they have nothing to do with anything or anyone outside the church. They, they feel no... A responsibility for other kids and other schools. It's, it's as if they have no concern for the world. They don't vote. Uh, they don't worry about the environment. Uh, they say, just as long as I'm saved, that's not my concern. I just live here. It's not like I, uh, I own the place. It's not my home. I'm not responsible. I'm just passing through, bound for the promised land. They're not Republican or Democrat. They're not liberal or conservative. They, they don't get involved in politics or anything so secular or profane. They, they don't worry about what everyone else worries about or argue about what everyone else argues about. And, and there's something admirable about that, I've got to say, because, you know, there's way too much arguing, I think, uh, about all kinds of things. But, but according to Peter, there, there's also something wrong about that. He says that the baptized are given milk and honey because, yes, our true home is the land of milk and honey, but he also says that we are to obey the government and pay our taxes and be the best citizens in town, which means, I think, getting involved. When we are baptized, we are to go back to our friends and our families and our communities, even if they don't share our faith, and, and be the best friend and neighbor and family member there is. They will know that we are Christians, not by our indifference, but by our difference. Especially by our love, which is, which is a different kind of love. It is a love for each other, for sure, but, 
But you remember how Jesus said that anyone can love those who love them? What's different is that we are called to love others uh, besides ourselves and each other and, and those who love us. What's different is that we are called to love the world that God loves so much, a world that, that, that mostly didn't believe in God and didn't love God back. It was to such a world, though, that God sent Jesus because God loved it so much. We are to follow the example of God, be like God, so that when people see us, they'll see God. Uh, because uh, we talk like God or think like God, uh, we're holy like God and loving like God, loving uh, without partiality. God makes no distinctions, doesn't do all this dividing between black and white, liberal and conservative, us and them, world and church, sacred and secular. Without partiality, God makes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on good and bad alike. Without partiality, God showers love and grace on everyone, and, and that's how Christians ought to be. Peter says to the baptized, now go back, go back and live this way. Go back into your community, back to your school, back into your family. That's where you are to live out your baptism. That's what Peter says, and, and I agree, but I also know that it can be risky, it can be dangerous, at least to one's soul or spirit. Send people into the world or, or, or the school or the family where they don't get much support, if any support, and, and they may not be able to keep the promises that they made when they were baptized. What's to keep them from getting sucked back into the world and developing the same prejudices and values so that, you know, six months later after they're baptized, you can't tell they're any different anymore. They've dried off, and, and now what's the difference? Culture, culture is a powerful thing, you know. People want to be like their friends. People want to fit in. They don't want to stand out. It, it might not be persecution, but... But most people don't want other people to think that they're weird or strange. People want to be liked. Generally speaking, anyway, people don't, don't like to be different, except maybe teenagers who want to be different like everyone else, all their friends. Or, or, or Pemco Insurance, you remember that commercial? Uh, who is a Pemco who's, who's a little bit different just like you? But other than that, what, you know, people don't want to be different. And well, what's to prevent one from slipping back into old habits? Even in good families, it can be hard. Imagine a young person is baptized, and with the blessing of God, she or he goes home. And then the very next Sunday, a pretty day like today, uh, the father gets up and he says, Hey, you know what? Why don't we all go to the lake? We can ski, we can swim, we can have a picnic. What do you say? Well, is this newly baptized person supposed to say, but it's Sunday, I'm supposed to be in church. That's a lot of pressure to put on a, a new Christian. Mom and dad, brother and sister, they're the most important people in the world, and, and she or he is supposed to go against them and say, well, I can't go because I have to go to church. Not everybody has a family like Mrs. Anderson. Whenever her children came to visit, she would say, when you visit me, you go to church, so bring some nice clothes. Now, her children were married. They had families of their own. They, they were adults who made up their own minds and did their own thing, and, and it didn't always include church. But Mrs. Anderson said, when you visit me, you go to church, so bring some nice clothes. And, and they said, yes, mother, and that's what they did. But when people go home, uh, all wet from getting baptized, are they going to get support? Or is it going to be, oh, come on, everybody else is doing it, everybody else will be there, you can go to church next Sunday, there's lots of Sundays. What's to prevent someone about whom Peter is talking from just going back to, to their old ways of talking and thinking and, and, and doing what everyone else does? Well, that's what makes our time together, our fellowship, our worship, our service so important, I think, that it be a time to enjoy each other, but especially to encourage one another. Because some of us may not get that at home or anywhere else. 
So it's important that our conversation be more than just how are the mariners doing or how are the flowers in your garden growing, but how is it with your soul? What's weighing on your mind? What are the pressures in your life? And then to pray for one another and lift each other up. I think that's really important. And maybe even more important now when we can't get together physically, that we, that we find other ways to stay in touch and connected and, and that we remember and pray for each other. It's also important that we be able to forgive one another too, you know, because none of us is perfect. Truly, it's not always easy to do the right thing. And, and Peter knows that better than anyone. Peter knows how difficult it can be to do the right thing sometimes. We, we make mistakes, we fail, we sin. Even church people, yes, church people. There are fightings without, there are fears within. We all live by grace and Peter knows that. And so he reminds us, Quoting from uh, the prophet Isaiah that uh, the word of God endures forever, he says. The word of God endures uh, the changing of the seasons. The word of God endures the endless need to fix or clean the house. The word of God endures the moving away of good friends and neighbors. Endures the increased frequency of, of trips to see the doctor. The Word of God endures the loss of family and friends, endures the growing realization that no, uh, no amount of savings can ensure a comfortable future. The Word of God endures our faults and our fears and our failures, endures pandemics and stay-at-home orders and a falling stock market. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is certain. There are no guarantees except this. God's grace is stronger than our sin, stronger than our shame. God's ability to forgive is, is far greater than our ability to fail. The Word of God endures all things, even death itself. That's a promise. So trust in God, believe in Jesus, Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen.